Give God a shout of praise. Come on. Come on. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Should you do me a favor and, uh, man, I'm excited. I got three weeks pent up in me, man. <laughs> you might want to go potty right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold off for a minute. Yeah, there you go, Tyler. Go ahead. No. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to take a little break from, from Luke. Um, while you're turning there, I just want to um, acknowledge those that may be watching us on Facebook from wherever. Uh, Paul Gould, I love you, man. And uh, he makes me say that. Just want you to know that. No, I love you. And if you're watching, it was good to see you while we were up there in South Carolina. Um, while you're turning there uh, to Matthew chapter 4, and please do so. Don't just, uh, don't just listen to me. Uh, you have the Word of God right there at your disposal. Like That's, that's a privilege. And um, I want you to always check and see what I'm, what I'm saying, because I'm not the gospel. I'm not the Word of God. Uh, I'm just doing my best to, to, to share the Word of God with you. Uh, that's where the power is, right? So Matthew chapter 4, go there. Uh, while you're going there, I just want to, I'm going to go to another place. I'm going to detour over uh, to a section of scripture found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And, and there, I want to go there for this reason. Um, I have, I, if, if you've been here more than a few times, you know that it, sometimes they get a little animated. I might, might yell at you a little bit. And, and, and so I get accused of being a yeller and, you know, you're hollering at us and you're being mean and people need to, to, to you need to love them. You need to love them. And, and you know, yeah, I get it. Okay. Um, so, so, but here, here's the thing, um, I'm reading this thing, I read, I preached on this a couple weeks ago when I was up in Massachusetts, I won't go long on this thing, but I'm, I'm preaching on this, and I, who agrees that the Apostle Paul loved his people, right? He went around and it said that he was, he was weeping with tears over them, right? And he longed to be with them, right? And he talked about loving them with the love of Christ, right? We know, anyone think that Paul loved the people of, those, of these churches, right? So, so here's Paul, and in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he, he says, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, he says, you should keep a clear mind in every situation, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, each and every one of us, if you're a believer, you have a separate ministry of something that God has gifted you to do, right? But we've all been called to one ministry. There's one ministry. If you're a believer, you're part of it. It's the ministry of reconciliation. It's to go make disciples of every person on earth, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I, Jesus, have taught you. That's everyone's ministry. Would you agree? Amen. Okay, so Paul says, fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now he says, he goes, I get it. It's not in there, that's my translation. <laughs> but he says, I get it. This is what he says. He goes, I got it. I understand that, God, you called me to, to preach the gospel to people, no matter what. I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to work hard at this thing. You've given me a ministry. Yep. And he says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. This is the last book he ever wrote. It wasn't years and years and decades from his uh, death. It was uh, weeks or months, like he knew it was not like uh, I'm mortal. No, I'm going to die soon. Like I know it, right? I'm going to die for my faith. And he says, my, the end of my life is, is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. See, he's, he's like, listen, I know the ministry God's given me to go preach the good news and endure suffering to do so. I'm gonna work hard at this thing. I'm gonna pour my life out to make sure that as many people as possible can know and love Jesus Christ. I know that that was what I was supposed to do. God gave me a, a to-do list. See, a lot of people talk about this, that, that look, God is not, a, he's not uh, keeping score and you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. Yes, that's so very true. If you, you don't have to do anything for him to love you. Did you know that God loves you? Yes. I'm here to tell you that he does. 
no matter what you've done. He loves a car salesman. He loves you. <laughs> However, don't be fooled. See, when you tell someone who's prone to sin, a broken person, that they don't have to do anything, they don't. They're like, oh, okay. Well, if God loves me by doing nothing, then I'll get all the rewards and all the blessings. I don't have to do nothing. But he says, I, I did, I, I, God gave me a to-do list. He said, go fully carry out your ministry, son. And he says, I did. And so because he got the to-do list and he did it, he said that this, uh, he's not gonna get a lot of attaboys in his lifetime. He didn't get many. He got whipped, beaten, and put in prison. But he says, but someday, the crown of righteousness is gonna be on my head that the Lord Jesus is gonna give me when he comes back. And he says, but that crown's not just available to me. It's available to anyone who would look forward to Christ's return. Let me ask you a question. Who has a job? Raise your hand. Paul, you sat up front. So if your boss was going on vacation for a week, and he, is your boss a man or a woman? Yeah. If that man gave you a to-do list, and he said, I'll be back next week. If you did the whole list, like Paul, you'd look forward to his return, wouldn't you? What happens if you didn't do the list? You'd be afraid to get fired. Fire? Just saying. Right? And so Paul says, listen, the people who will look forward to Christ's return, who will get the crown of righteousness are the ones who take care of my to-do list. And that's why I get up and I yell at you, just like he's getting up and yelling at those people because he's passionately in love with them and he wants them to have this. And, and his whole idea is get your mind off of the comforts and the pleasures of this world and get your mind and your eyes on Christ and his mission because if you don't, it's not gonna be a good day when he comes back. And all the lovey fuzzy that you've heard in churches, you can throw that right out the window. The ones who have taken care of the to-do list are going to look forward to his return, and the ones who have not, it's not going to be a good day. Did you read it? I didn't make it up. And so that's why I preach the way that I preach, and that's why I preach the subjects that I preach, because I, I love you. I, I'm not going to cry right now. I refuse but I love you, and, and God has, has given you to me in a sense. Not, you're, I don't own you, but he said that I should care for the flock that God has entrusted to me. And how good of a pastor would I be if I talked to you about the things of this world here right now and how to have your best life now and, and forego the crown of righteousness that could be yours when he rips the sky open. And so I preach things that are difficult to hear and not everybody wants to hear it and maybe all the seats won't be full because of it, but I'm never going to stop, ever stop doing that Amen. because I love you. Amen. And uh, how many, thank you. And how many parents yell at their kids, right? Come on now, don't leave me hanging, right? Did you yell at them because you hate them? No. You love them so much that if they're about to cross the road, Jackson! Because, you're right, that's not being mean. It's like, I love you and I don't want you squished. Yeah. Right? So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm yelling at you because I want to get your attention. And I'm going to preach firm things. And that's not going to be um, excluded tonight. That's going to be tonight too. Thank you, Moses. My pleasure and joy. Um, <clears throat> before I left, the last week I was here, I preached a message to you. And um, maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. But I talked about that sin no longer has control over you. Amen. Remember when I asked you if you believe the Red Sea opening and you said, yeah, I believe that. And I, and I asked you, do you believe if this, and I, I quoted all these real easy, you know, JV varsity, 
JV, JV Bible verses that you all said, yeah, I believe it, I believe it, right? You believe it. So then I read in Romans chapter 6 about because of what Christ did on the cross, that sin no longer has control over you. It no longer has dominion. It's not your king. It's not your ruler. You don't have to listen to it. These things that you say that, that are addictions that control you are not addictions. The Bible says that you are a master. The, um, Whoever you choose to obey becomes your master. That you decide what your addictions will be. Stephanus, the man in 1 Corinthians chapter something, said that it said that Stephanus addicted himself to the work of the ministry. It's the only time in God's word that the word addiction or addicted is ever used. It's the choice of the believer. And the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And you're strong enough to make a decision to not sin because Jesus said so. And that's the truth of God's word. And so we believe that, but I also ask you if you keep sinning all the time and everyone in here raise their hand. Truth. Sin no longer has control over you. Do you agree? You sin like crazy, do you agree? See that space? That's a problem. And we talked about the fact that a lot of us treat these Bible verses as rhetoric instead of reality. And so I ended there and I went, took off and, and, and left for three weeks and now I'm back. But during the time that I was gone, I was like, oh, I gotta get back into Luke. But no, I started reading more and more and I started coming across all these other verses. I was like, man, there's, there's massive gap there in my life. There's, gap, there's massive gap there in your lives. And I got to preach this stuff. And so I want to take um, the next three weeks. So here's our plan. We're going to take the next three weeks. So it'll be a total of like a four-week mini-series. And uh, calling it moving. I'm going to call it moving from rhetoric to reality. And uh, we're going to preach for the next three weeks on some hard topics I'm going to be in your face. Um, and then we'll jump back into Luke for maybe uh, three or four weeks. And then it'll be Christmas time, you know. And we'll do a little bit of, you know, Ricky Bobby, baby Jesus stuff. You know, whatever. And uh, so anyway, so that's the plan. Um, let's, I don't want to ever assume that everybody knows what rhetoric is. Don't raise your hand if you do or you don't. But um, rhetoric is... Basically this, when you talk about a title saying moving from rhetoric to reality, it's this. Rhetoric is impressive or persuasive language, but it lacks substance. It's got no, it's got no meat in it. It's got no content, right? It sounds good. The best illustration I can give you is a political speech, right? They get up and they use all the correct words of like the tax codes and, and, and universal health care. They use all the right words. You're like, yeah, that sounds good. And the, you know, the people on this side are saying, that sounds good. And the people are saying, that sucks. And you know, they're fighting back and forth. But it sounds like this, like, but no, not, it has no meaning. Like nobody ever does it. They just, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, they don't do nothing, right? They just say a bunch of stuff and it, rhetoric, it just sounds good. But it really, really has any substance or meat. It doesn't really do anything. So I want to study some of these, um, some of these verses in Scripture. You know, the, 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 the Bible in its entirety is, is, is pregnant with incredible truth, right? Every single verse is, is, is pregnant with truth. And, and some of them are more popular than others, right? Anyone have a, a famous, uh, favorite Bible verse that they could just quote off right now? Which one is it? Famous one. What's that? Yeah, do that. You guys got that? Do it. What else? Which is? Awesome. What else? Which? Yeah, awesome. Any others? Yeah. Uh, awesome. So, so some of these are really, really popular. Like that, well, that's probably the most popular ever, right? And then Philippians 4, 3, that's right there. That's close. That's neck and neck. Um, but here's the thing. Some of them are so popular, they make it onto T-shirts, right? And, and, and coffee cups and bumper stickers. And they're so popular, and, and these truths, those right there, and all the popular ones, and all the not so popular ones, all of them together, the Bible itself would say of these truths in Ephesians 6, 17, that this stuff, 
is the sword of the Spirit. It's the chosen tool of Almighty God to powerfully do stuff, get stuff done, right? That's his tool to, to accomplish things in this world through his people and in people, right? That's what he uses, his word. It's the sword of the Spirit. And Hebrews 4.12 would say of this sword that it's alive and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Listen how sharp it is, right? It can actually cut between soul and spirit. Can you even understand what that is? Say, I cannot. Because it's all that immaterial thing of who you are and what you're going to be forever and all that kind of cool stuff, right? But no one can really fully explain or understand that somehow this sword is so sharp and powerful and able that it can get between things that can't be split. Awesome. And then it says, and it can cut between joint and marrow. Like joint is the outside, like where the two bones come together, right? The outside of the bone. And then marrow is the inside of the bone. It's like, it's a bone. But somehow the word of God is so accurate and powerful and sharp and truthful that it can even get between things that can't be split. That's how powerful it is, right? But as powerful and accurate and sharp, so in other words, as able as the word of God is, Sometimes familiarity dulls the sword. And the effectiveness of the verse will lessen. And the verse I want to examine tonight is found in Matthew chapter 4. This is what I'm talking about. You know, this verse we're going to study is also in Mark and Luke. That means it's super famous. Did you know that not every single verse in the scriptures is repeated? Did you know that? So when it is, must be pretty important, right? God's trying to make a point. Why would it be in three Gospels the same thing? Because we don't listen well. He's trying to get a point across. So it must be really, really super important, right? So let's move beyond rhetoric to reality. You guys ready for that? Look at somebody and say, let, let, let's get ready to move. Let's get ready to move. Okay, Matthew chapter 4. Are you there? We're going to read verse 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22. You there? Yes. All right, here we go. I'm, li I'm reading out of the NLT. If you don't have that version, do your best to keep up, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back together again here in a minute. Um, one day, as, I love how random that is. Just one day. One day. One day. What day was it? I don't know. Just one day. Random. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them. I want you to, I want you to like feel like you're there, you know? So I'm going to call out to you. Come follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. I don't like that translation. I'll make you fishers of men. That's what it says. I'll make you fishers of men. This, this right here, weak, this Vern. This is leaving um, option. I'll show you how, but you don't have to do it. No, no, no. Lame. All other translations. I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. Okay, that's what it says. And they, I love this. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two bro other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them too. Would you think that he called them the same thing? And he called to them too, probably, come follow me. I'll, I'll make you fishers of men. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty bold guy. Like, I, 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 you don't scare me. And I, I'll say, I'll, if, especially when I'm, when I'm talking about this stuff, because I know it's true. I don't come up with much on my own. Uh, but if it's this stuff, I'm pretty bold. I'll, I'll, I'll say it to anybody. I'll talk to anybody about it. It doesn't make I'm I'm pretty bold guy. But just think about this Jesus. Think of the audacity of this man, right? Here comes Jesus, right? They, if you read before this, he hadn't started his ministry yet. 
Nothing's really happened. We all know some stories about what Jesus did. Miracles and all that stuff, walking on water and Peter walking on water and, and feeding thousands of people with a happy meal, all that kind of good stuff. But none of that stuff had happened yet. So here comes this dude. This, this guy is, is, is Joseph's son who's a, car, a laborer, or just a carpenter in this little town called Nazareth. What, what, what good could come from Nazareth is what everyone thought. Like it's a, it's a little podunk town. And, and here's this little, this dude, right? He comes walking 20 miles, it's almost. It's about 20 miles from Nazareth to where this is happening. So he's just in this obscure place, obscure guy, and he comes walking along the beach, and he walks over to these guys that don't know him, but he knows them, and he calls out to these perfect strangers, hey, come follow me. He calls them to leave all that they know, all that would ever identify who they are. Did you notice in the text that it's not by accident? It says that they were throwing a net into the water, comma, for they fished for a living. That's an identity statement, right? That's what they do. Hi, what's your name? I'm Sam. What do you do? Like, isn't that the normal thing? Isn't that the conversation everybody has? It's part of, our, of who we are. It's our identity. And so it says it right there in the scriptures. God wants you to understand they had an identity. He was about to switch it. He said, these are fishermen, and, and he wants them to completely walk away from everything they know, everything that identifies who they are, to completely repurpose their lives with no explanation, no convincing, no selling, no proving that he's worthy. Peter, Andrew, James, John, come on, let's go. That's not uncommon for God to do. He did the same thing with Moses. Moses. He's up there on the mountain, and he says, hey, Moses, I, I heard the cry of my people. Now go. I'm sending you. You must go deliver my people. Read the words. That's what it says. There wasn't a whole lot of option there. Now, Moses complained, because that's what guys named Moses that are Jewish do. We complain. <laughs> but but he, like, he complained, but there was not a whole lot of option. This is what it says. I've heard the cries of my people. Now go. I am sending you. You must. Who likes to hear that? You must lead my people out of Egypt. People don't like to hear this facet of truth, do you? Nobody likes to hear this. You don't hear it much in churches. But did you know that loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is a command? Did you know that? How does that even work in this world where I have to sell myself so you'll fall in love with me? How does that even work? Meredith, you will love me. Do you understand me? <laughs> yeah, how, you think, how good do you think that's going to go? But God says that. Yeah. It's a command. It's not just a command. Do you guys know what it's called? The greatest command. Yes. Like, if there was a scale of most important, someone asked Jesus, what's the big one? You must love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. It's not an option. You must. If you want to look that up and see if I'm telling you the truth, Matthew 22, 37. How about this one, Deuteronomy? Because that's New Testament, right? That's the new God. You know what I'm saying. How about the old God, the smiter? Deuteronomy 10, 17, you ready? And now Israel, what's Israel? What's that even mean? God's people, his people, his people, right? And, the, and if you're a Christian, it says now we're his people, right? So this is for you, just like it was to them. He says, now Israel, what does the Lord your God, re ooh, re oh, I can't even say it, right? Ooh, require of you, require command. Who wants to hear this? Tell me some grace, Moses. Um, what does the Lord your God require of you? It's a question. And then he answers it. Doesn't leave you hanging like some people would do. He says he requires, I love this, only, <laughs> he requires that you only, just, like I could ask for more, that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him. That's kind of weak too. So most translations will say, uh, walk in obedience. Yes. Walk in his ways. 
and love him and, how many people love him? Okay. And serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Now, I just need to ask you guys a question. How much wiggle room has Almighty God given you there? Show me. Right here. There's your grace message. <clears throat> so he looks at these guys who don't even know who he is and says, I want you to leave your boats and I want you to leave your nets. I want you to leave everything, all the material gain that you've gathered. I want you to, I want you to leave all that you use to provide for yourself. And I want you to leave your family. He, he told James and John to leave their dad. It says that they left him in the boat with the employees. See ya. I want you to leave your material. I want you to leave your provision. I want you to leave your family, your blood family. I'm going to put you in a new blood family, my blood. And I want you to be part of that. And, and all of that, the, the audacity of this command, come, follow me. All for this, I will make you fishers of men. I don't know about you, but that's just stinking weird. That's just weird, right? That, it, I mean, is that weird? Am I the only one who thinks that's weird? I think that's really stinking weird. I'm going to make you fishers of men. What the heck does that mean? What would they even think? Here's, here's you know, gritty, rough, tough fisherman and he's like I'll make you fish I want you to come leave everything you know and then come do this thing that you have no idea what I'm talking about come on let's go come on guys let's go what is he what what is that even do you think they had any questions in their mind do you think they were thinking like yeah it sounds good you know I feel this tractor beam pulling me towards this guy I don't know what it is but but what like what is that do you think maybe I'm just saying, do you guys think maybe that there's some questions in their mind, some doubt, some, some fear? I might, do you think I'm doing the right thing here? I mean, like, I don't even know this guy. He, he's some weirdo walking down the beach. I've been to the beach. There's some weirdos at the beach, right? They even look like Jesus often. I think they're trying to play this thing out, right? But, but, but they, they're Jesus on weed. It's totally different. And, and so, like, so this guy comes walking down the beach, and he's like, hey, uh, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. So they probably have some, like, they're curious, like what is, I, I would say they probably had some questions. But notice how the people respond. The Bible says it in two ways. It says that they responded at once and immediately. Like did they have questions and doubts and fears, would you say? I would say they probably did. Do you think they had it all figured out at first? Did they have the, 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 the question of why should I follow this guy? Did, he ha did they have all that question hammered down and in their notebook already? Did they have it? Did they have anything to go on here? No. Nothing. But they did it. It was just obedience. He said follow and they did. And let me tell you something, listen. All blessing flows into the life of of the believer through the funnel of obedience. And there's no way around that. You understand? It all comes down to that. He said, do this and I'll bless. You can't not do your to-do list and expect the crown and the reward that's promised at the end if you don't do it, Amen. right? That's just the way it is. I'm not saying that it's a salvation of works, that you have to earn it or, or, or anything like that to be saved. No, no. You just have to receive what he did on the cross to be saved. You just have to know that he loves you whether you're saved or not. But if you want the crown of righteousness when the sky opens up, you got a to-do list. Amen. And he wants some things of you. When he invests in the believer, there's parables about this. When he invests in the believer, he expects a return. A hundredfold. Do you understand? The ones who had, uh, what, two got four. The one who had five got ten. The one who had one brought back nothing except that. It didn't go well for that guy. He wants a return on his investment. And so I can't stress it enough. Blessing follows 
obedience. But the problem is we're, at a, we're in a fight all the time because we're in a culture that insists on uh, marketing people. See, we have to market people all the time. That's what it is. Anytime a, a, a product comes out, a good, a service, whatever, they, they market the people. Like, because the people, like us right here, we're the center of everything. And so there's this need to market us, to sell us on something so that we would want to buy the product. You know, did you ever notice all the pretty girls in the Bud Light commercials? They make the guys, and they're all drunk idiots, so they think that if they drink light beer from Miller, they're going to have these girls. That's marketing, right? Because they play on the stupid, foolish minds of men. And did you ever, and how about, how about, listen, how about if I, did you ever see the Matthew McConaughey ads for Lincoln? Oh my God, I'm going to throw up right here. You know, if I drive a Lincoln, I can be Matthew McConaughey too. Oh my, <laughs> seriously. Like, what is that, right? Have you guys seen the ads? They're nauseating, right? Just go buy my $50,000 car and all of a sudden, your voice will get sexy. Like, come on, dude. He's got his, you know, he's up there like this with his big old bling and Rolex, you know, like, please, dude. What's that? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but but it, that's the truth of it, right? We have to be sold. We have to be sold. We have to be lured in and convinced and, and everything has to be packaged just right so we'll want to buy it. But the call of Jesus to follow him is there and he doesn't need any marketing assistance. He said, come and follow me. And, and don't say, well, it's different back then because they were, he, they were there and he, and he said it right to, like, no, listen, don't be fooled into thinking that his verbal command is any more powerful than his quoted command. It's the same thing. Okay, this is the word of God. This is the word of God to you. And so he says, come and follow him. You come and follow him. And listen, if you're in this place right here, right now, you're being called. You're being called right here, right now. Okay, do you feel the tractor beam? I think one of the problems too, there's a problem with following. We think it's optional. We think we need to be sold and package up this Jesus just right so he's attractive and it's what I would need. Well, he went to these people and he said, come, and they just went. So there's a problem there that we need to close that chasm. There's also another problem with the fishing part. That's a big problem. It's a huge problem. This is a misconception of the fishing thing. He said, come and I will make you a fisher of men. So when you think about fishing, right? You got a picture up there? It's kind of fishing. Isn't that fishing, right? Especially down here in Florida, that's what we do, right? It's Lake County. We got lakes everywhere. Everyone's fishing, right? That's kind of normal fishing for around here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you're sitting there in a the boat. So when, I, when I, we talk about fishing, you're sitting in a boat with your buddies, probably drinking that light beer from Miller. <clears throat> but no, you sit in the boat for real, and uh, you know you got the rod and the reel, and just drifting along, and you've got you know a hula pop or some jig or crankbait or something on there, and you're you know, or, or you got a, you know, the old school. Remember when you were a little kid and your dad would take you fishing the first time? You had like a, a line with a bobber and a hook with a worm on it, right? That was actually a pretty good bait, right? But, but, but see, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the picture that comes to mind when we think about fishing. You know, because of this culture that we live in now, that's kind of the thought about fishing, but that's not what it is. See, when Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, he's not talking about that kind of fisherman. He's not talking about the person that would sit in a boat and, and have a rod and a reel and have a bait on the end and wait for something to bite it. See, back then it was different. They were fishermen, right? But they didn't do this. They were in a boat with a net and they threw the net out onto the water and it would just dive down and scoop up anything that was there. It was kind of a, it was an, it was an attack, if you will. You know, the fish are just going along and here comes the net and on the edges of the net there would be weights right? And so when you threw it in, you'd see him go like this, and the net would sprawl wide open, and then the, the weights would pull it down, and it would scoop up and capture anything that was there. And so they had to pull out the good ones and separate from the good from the bad. But they threw a net. See, they would go, so when Jesus says, I want to make you fishers of men, think about what they were thinking. No, they were thinking, okay, I'm going to go after this thing. 
I'm going after people. I'm not, I'm not gonna sit and wait for some pre-packaged bait that looks like something appetizing to try to trick the fish into biting it. Or in this case, to, to get some pre-packaged gospel that, that would make it attractive and trick the people into maybe biting it. Maybe making it their own. It was an aggressive move, not a passive one like on the screen. And so in the church, here's the problem. The people, they want to be taught how to share their faith. And they want to be taught what to say and how to say it. And here's the Romans road. And here's the way of the master. And we're going to do evangelism training. Preacher, just give me some bait so people will bite. No. You are not called to share your pastor's faith. You're called to share your faith. And if you have been given the faith to trust in Christ, then you have your own faith. And you need to just open your mouth and tell people the story. It doesn't matter if they want to receive it or not. It doesn't matter if they agree or, or say yes and you take them to church and lead them to the altar to say yes or not. It doesn't matter. That's not your concern. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you men and women who throw out the net and aggressively go after people. That's what I want from you. Followers of Jesus are fishers of men. I gotta tell you when, it uh, goes back a number of years now, but when Brent Bickhart led me to Jesus, it's the pastor that had the, uh, the guts to just talk to me at the car dealership one day, just tell me about Jesus, brought me to tears. I could tell you when I went and I talked to him, and then even the day that I was at Chili's up in Leesburg, it's now closed, but um, I went there and I, two grown men held hands, it was kind of nice, and uh, we bowed our heads, you know, and we prayed. And I said yes to Jesus. Let me just tell you something. I was kind of like Peter and Andrew and James and John, like I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have all those answers. I didn't have it all, I didn't graduate seminary and then go, you know what, based on what I have found out to be true, I will make you my Lord. I had tons of questions about who Jesus was and what in the world was I even doing here right now, right? And if you're not a Christian, but somehow you're here right now, I'm super happy that you're here. But you probably have questions too about this Jesus thing. And I can tell you right now, you're not gonna get all your questions answered here tonight, although I would enjoy doing that all night long. You know I would. But you're not going to get all your answers questioned here tonight. But here's the invitation that Jesus gave then and he gives you tonight. Come follow me. Come follow me. And then he'll answer your questions. So listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use any bait. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to use any prepackaged way of the master, Romans road thing, something that I learned from a class, from some evangelist, evangelist that told me, hey, you're supposed to take them first to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. For those who believe, right, no, that you'll know that you'll have eternal life. And then you take them to the Romans and tell them that they're a sinner and they're going to go to hell. And, and then, do, you, do you believe it? Yeah, okay, let's pray. Like, no, totally lame. Say, that's lame. That's totally lame, right? I'm not going to use bait. I'm going to tell you about my faith. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw the net out over you. I'm going to tell you that it was... I don't know, 15, 16 years ago that I was a man that was chasing after every single awful thing that America would offer a young man. Every single one. I was like Solomon who, re who refused himself no good pleasure. Everything I wanted, I went after. And I was good at it. But somehow in achieving all of that, conquering, I, was, I still had this massive empty hole inside of me. I was, I was, I was, I was painfully empty. And, and I was... I was a, a complete marriage failure. I had tried three times, twice before this happened, to be married, and it just didn't work. And I, I, was, a, I was a loser, man. I was a loser. And, and, and I was the person that you're, you tell your kids, your daughters to stay away from, and your sons don't be friends with him. And I was a disgusting, porn-addicted, lying, cheating car salesman and a lush on top of it. And in that sewer, Jesus reached down and saved me. Amen. I don't even know why. 
I mean, I know why theologically, because he loves me, but I don't know why he would love me. <clears throat> but I accepted his invitation, and I followed him. And, and, and now, like, I had questions. I still do. That's why I study and stuff. But, but I, didn't, I didn't know everything. But I accepted his invitation to follow him, and now I have purpose in my life every single day. Yeah. I wake up with a reason to wake up. And I have a calling on my life to preach his word. My closest family are, are you guys right here in this room. It's been a huge change for me. Before I was wealthy, I did, I did well. <clears throat> but spiritually, I was dead. And when it came to purpose and fulfillment, I was completely poverty stricken. I would get up. I'd lie to someone and sell them a car. I'd make a good check. I'd go home. I'd buy some crap that I didn't need. And I'd go do it again tomorrow. And that was it. That's sad. And most of the world's doing that. But now I'm like the Apostle Paul. He said, I am, this is his quote, not mine, but it's, I could have, it's mine. You know, he said, I am poor, but give spiritual riches to others. I own nothing, and yet I have everything. And that's what Jesus did for me, and that's what he wants to do for you. I'm not special. And on top of that, just like he threw, throws in a bonus, you get to go to heaven forever. And he wants to do that for you too. But you know what else Jesus did in and around my life? Here's a, here's a big net. Matthew 16, 18 says that I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not stop it. I'm gonna build my church. So here's this dude walking along the beach, one man, and he goes up to four guys and says, let's start something. And here in 2018, a third of the world is following him. He's building his church. And by God's grace, we here at Revolution are part of that. And so I just want to share, with, I saw a lot of hands go up when I said you hadn't been to a vision dinner, so maybe this is new to you, maybe it's not, but Jesus has a story to tell here in this place. You know, we, we came to this building in May of 216, right? Wasn't it? May of 216. And we unlocked the door, a group, I don't know how many people in this room, probably maybe this many, and we had $4,500 in the bank. And there was no way that we could rent 10,000 square feet next to Home Depot on 441. We had no money. This place was empty from that door all the way back, not to this wall, but to the wall right there where the bathrooms are. There was nothing in it. We had no money and no people. So who rents a space like that? God's people, right? And, and so we, we moved in here, and, and, but before we did, I, I, we had to do a little like research. Like, do you think we could do it? I, 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 I gotta tell you, I didn't think that we could do it. My wife, she's a great woman of faith. She believed that we could do it, but I, I didn't believe that we could do it. But I would go through the process of, of like doing a little research to see if maybe, you never know, maybe it could happen, right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it could happen that, that we could actually move in here and, and let God do something crazy here. So I started to, to do a little research, and I, I went to, the, to, the, to the, the city officials, the building department, and I said, well, can we move into this space? And he said, you could do this. It's zoned for it and, it's, and all that, but um, you're going to need to get a, an architect to, to build you a plan. You can't just draw it on the back of a, a piece of paper, you know, like your kid with a crayon. I need some certified plans. Anyone ever work with an architect before? It's expensive. We have 4,500 bucks in the bank. How far do you think it's going to go to get an architect to draw up plans for a 10,000 square feet commercial? So he gave me the name of a couple of architects. The first one I called happens to be an associate pastor. He said, I'll do your plans for free. The moment I walked in this building and met with you, I knew God wanted you here. Free architect. He said, but uh, you're going to have to get a, a general contractor now. 
It's like, I don't know any general contractors. What am I going to do with that? He's like, you can't just have like you and your buddy, Nate, you know, build stuff, right? You're going to have to get some real builders in here. You need a general contractor. So I, I called the guy who, 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 who was our landlord at our last church. And I said, uh, Daniel, would you, would you be our general contractor? We're going to move out of there. We're going to come over here. And I need someone to be a general contractor. I don't need you to do the work. We'll do the work. Because we got some guys. We'll do the work. But I need you to sign off on the plans and stuff. And sorry. But he goes, hell no. I'm not doing that. I built this company for 25 years. One person gets hurt. And I'm done. No way. I said, okay. My wife told me I should be praying for open and closed doors. Well, the, the door closed. Or so I thought. The next day I get a phone call. On my phone it says, his, I call him Daniel Church because I can't pronounce his last name. Daniel Church answers. He's ringing. I pick it up. I go, hello? He doesn't even say hi. He goes, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> right? Okay. He goes, but you're going to need to get a, a, a licensed pulling electrician and plumber and, and sprinkler guy and... and all the, every, uh, licensed real guys, no handy guys, right? Real guys. I'm like, I don't know anybody. So we got a um, licensed electrician for free, a licensed plumber for free. We got our sprinklers installed for free. We had an AC company, Rapture Air. I'll give him a shameless plug because they were good to us. Um, he did all the uh, AC work that we needed to do in the building for free. We needed 130 sheets of drywall to do all the things, the walls and stuff that we did at a company I've never even heard of, donated it for free. Uh, all the paint that you see on every bit of these walls, <laughs> you guys know, some of you guys know this story, the Bear representative, B-E-H-R, right? Bear, paint. He went over to all the Home Depots. He's the local Bear rep for the region. He went to all of his Home Depots and bought all the Glidden paint and donated it to this church. <laughs> And he walked in with a shopping cart full of glidden paint, their best stuff, and gave it to the church, right? Free paint, right? Those pews, free. The chairs, free. Um, the office partitions back there in the classrooms, that's $20,000 worth of office partitions donated to this church by an aerospace technology firm in Merritt Island. Where's that? I don't even know what that even is. They build rockets or something, right? They donated them to the church. For free. It was really funny when, when uh, we needed to frame the bathroom. The guy who was framing it decided to bail. That happens, right? So I didn't know what we were going to do. I go over to Home Depot one day to go buy something, and I walk in over by the pro desk, and there's this guy, Steve. I haven't seen him in a couple of years. He, was a, he used to be a youth pastor at a church over in Umatilla, and I saw him over there, and he's like, hey, man, what's going on? He's the God is good guy, you know, and he said, God is good. And I said, yeah, God is good, except we need a bathroom built. And um, he's a framer. He goes, oh, really? Well, I'll, I'll frame it for you. Right? So, I mean, this is what's happening. So he comes over there and he frames the whole bath, you know, the bathroom complex back there. That wasn't there. So he frames it all for free. Now, in the process, he shot me through the arm with a four-inch framing nail. That wasn't cool. <laughs> but I'm a Jewish guy who took a nail for the church, so... You don't get sermon illustrations like that easy. But you know, God is so good because when I, when I took the nail, right? Sometimes you got to go through a little suffering to receive some blessing, right? That's what, kind of what we just talked about. I took the nail through the arm and it was really, really painful. Worst pain I ever felt in my life. But when they put me, when they put me in the hospital when this thing was sticking through my arm, they, they took my blood pressure and they said, you got really high blood pressure, Mr. Robert. They called in a heart specialist. Like it was, I was like, what the heck's going on here, man? Why, I have a nail in my arm and you're car, calling in a cardiologist? We got problems over here, right? He's like, you got really bad high blood pressure. I'm like, yeah, duh. I know. He's like, so I'm gonna, I, I, the reason I knew that, but I had never gone to a doctor. I can't afford it. I got no money. I don't have insurance. Can't afford prescription medication, right? So he puts me on, on, on a prescription that's free at Publix for the next year. So I got this greater healing. So they yanked the nail out and then my blood pressure's in check. Praise God. So after all this stuff is, so here we are, right? So after all these things are offered to be done for free, we still needed $10,550 $10, to move in here to pay for other supplies to get it done, right? So we, we got all the research. We've done our due diligence. And, and Jesus even says we should count the cost before we build, right? So that's what we did. So then we got the cost. And we, we're going to need $10,550. We only got $4,500. 
But I just said, ah, what the heck? So me and one of the elders of the church, we go over the, to the realtor's office that's repping this place, and we walk in, and then it was Dan Tatro over here from Grizzard. We sit down at his office. He's got this King Arthur round table thing over there with all of his papers all over it. And he's sitting at his computer, and he turns around, and, and we're sitting there. He goes, how can I help you guys today? I said, well, we'd like to talk to you about the possibility of renting the space next to Home Depot. Before I even got that out of my mouth, he goes, you know what, I just want to let you know that when you called me a few months ago to find out the size and the cost, I called the owner of the building, and he told me if they ever call you back, give them six months free rent. Guess what six months free rent is? 10-5. You ain't clapping? You ain't clapping for God? Seriously? That's crazy. That's what he did. That's, you just got the net through over you. And that's not some prepackaged thing, right? That's my story. That's my faith, right? It's not a class on how to do it. That's fishing for men. I threw out my net on top of you and I told you my story, right? And all the answers aren't there though, are they? They're not there about Jesus. You know, when Jesus healed the, the, the blind guy in John chapter 9, he, used a, he took up some dirt and he spit in it. And he smeared the mud on the dude's eyes. <laughs> Talk about weird. Jesus is weird, man. And, 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 it, and it worked. <laughs> And, and, and the people are like, what in the world? You know, and, they, and they're asking this guy, like, what, how did, what happened here? Like, who did this? How did it happen? He's like, listen, I don't know how it worked. Like, he had questions. This guy took mud and he spit and he rubbed it on my face and said, you're healed and go see. And he's like, yeah, I, oh, I don't understand. But I know this. That guy right there did this, and I was blind, but now I see. That's it. That's the story. That's the net. Did, did that guy understand how the, 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 the chemical composition of Jesus' holy spit? Was it a certain type of mud at a certain temperature and consistency, and, and this is why? And, you know, like, I don't know, man. The guy spit in my face, and now I see. Follow him. That's, that's the net, man. That's the net. I want to invite the band to come back up. And, um, man, isn't that story about this church? Isn't that, isn't that just amazing? It's amazing, right? But listen, in a minute, guess what we're going to sing? Do it again. Do it again. Amen. Our church has struggled as of late. If you come here, you see it. But God is faithful. And I believe that our best days are ahead of us. But listen, church, we have to treat what Jesus says as reality, not rhetoric. Okay? He said, I will make you fishers of men. And that statement doesn't just sound good, doesn't belong just on a t-shirt. He said, when you follow me, that's what Christians are. That's what Christians do. Like if you're a believer, you have a story, right? And you got to use it. Don't sit and wait for me to teach you what to say and how to say it. That story of the church is all of ours. It's not mine. It's all of ours. He did it for us. So you got that. But if you're a Christian, then you have a story to tell. And don't think that because you don't have all the answers for the people that they're not going to respond. I don't know. I was blind and now I see. I don't know. So let's just use our story. Don't just make these verses that are so familiar just sound cool, but there's no meat to them. Are you a Christian? Yes. Then you're a fisher of men. Now listen, I want to ask, would you do me a favor? Would you grab this basket right here? 
And would one of you grab this basket right here, please? We're going to receive our offering now. Listen. I'm, hold on a moment. One moment, one moment. I'm excited about being back. Now, I've heard the horror stories of, of nobody being here on the weekend and, you know, you're going to come back to an empty church. And let me tell you something. Our, our giving is in the tank. I want to just share with you because I, I want to be very honest and open and upfront with you, just so you know. Today, I text our landlord said, I can't pay the rent yet. We just don't have it. I understand that Irma costs people money. People haven't been coming. The preacher was away, so they figure it's their weekend off. That's Bible, re that's more rhetoric. He said, don't neglect meeting together. So, but I understand what's going on, you know, it's just what happened. And so we're, we're struggling financially. But listen, when I think and I tell that story about what happened here, that gets me excited again, right? And when I think about the lives that have been changed in this church through this ministry. When I think of, of the hundreds of people that have come to know Jesus through this church and have been in that tank to be baptized, that fires me up, right? I'm excited about that. Has, and let me ask you a question. Has anyone been impacted greatly through this church? Oh, yes. Anybody give? Have they? Raise your hand. Give, if you have, let God know about it, please. Give them a shout. Just give them a shout, right? That's good, right? That's awesome. And, 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 and look, we, I, want, I want our church to, to be a massive impact on the world. What he's done for you, he wants to do for others. What he's done here to create this place, he'll do to sustain and increase this place. And so I want to leave you with this before we, these guys come around the room and, and shake you down, right? We don't usually do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Here's what it says, right? In Exodus chapter 35, the Lord told Moses to go tell the people to give to my work. And, and this is what it says in verse 29. And I think it's appropriate because we just talked about what God had done here and what he wants to do. We got our vision dinner coming tomorrow night and stuff. And, and you know, we could do great things here for the Lord. Amen? And so he says, this is how the people respond. It says, so the people of Israel... Every man and woman, like not just some, but every man and woman who was eager to help in the work the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. And so I just want to ask you, I want to, if, if, if you want to participate in the work of the Lord, if you're excited about what the Lord can do through this church, if you're excited about what he's done and excited about what he could do and you want to be a part of that, I'm going to ask you to give generously tonight. Not only do we need help here, I mean, I'm just being, I would hate to come to you a couple weeks from now and say, hey, we're out of money and, and have you say, well, I wish you told me. I could have helped. Like, that would be negligent, right? So here's the moment of transparency because we're family. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We just got this need. But I also, I don't, want to, I don't want you to give out of that. I want you to give because you're excited about what the Lord could do through this place, through you. And so I want you to just think about it for a moment. I'm going to pray with you, and I want to, I want to ask the Lord to, 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 to share with you individually how you could give. You know, we did this years ago, and, and people bring in their, their old jewelry that they didn't need, and so we were in a hole, and, and people gave gender. It was just an awesome thing. And and, and you can see that's what they did here in the Old Testament too. They, they brought their gifts and gave it freely. So I don't know what the Lord's going to tell you, but let's ask him. And then I just want to, I wanted you to just be obedient, please. Remember what I said earlier. All blessing comes to the believer through the funnel of obedience. So let's pray and do as he says. Father, thank you so much for this night and for these people. Lord, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this place and for the amazing show of power and provision that you have, you have shown this church to make this place a reality that we're even sitting in this place tonight is nothing short of miraculous, unexplainable favor, unbelievable, Lord. And we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for all those that are, that are not even part of this church other churches that, that sent money here to, to help make this a reality. <coughs> 
people that live out of state that, that know about the church that just wanted to bless and send resource so this could happen. But ultimately, it's all because of you. You put it in their heart to be generous. And so, Lord, I'm asking right now that you'd speak to your people that, are, that call this church home. Not to the folks in other states, but right here, right now. If we are eager to participate in the work of the Lord, tell us how we should give. Tell us now, Lord. We'll get quiet and we'll listen, Lord. And then we'll give according to what you say. these men come across the room I want you to know if you want to give electronically you can it is 2017 so you don't need to use the basket we have a giving station in the foyer by the flat screen you can give there on the computer or you can give on our revolutionchurch.cc page you can give that way or there's some boxes on the walls back there you can give any way the Lord would lead you to give so I'm going to have the, these gentlemen go forth through the room and just do whatever the Lord has asked you to do. you this week. I'm going to challenge you this week. I'm going to challenge you to find one person, one, one person that's not a Christian and cast your net. Just cast your net. Tell them your story or tell them about what happened here. I just loaded your lips. I told you everything that went down. Just let them know your story and then invite them to come be a part of what God's doing here. Amen? I want to let you know that I do love you and I'm so happy to be back here with you guys. And if you need me for anything, you know, I'll be around all week and, and uh, you can call me anytime or come by and see me or whatever. But blessed to be back and thank you for letting me share God's word with you. Thank you.